Today, I'm here with Justin Rollins, and he has written a book that I'm halfway through right now, The Lost Boys, A Dark Side of Graffiti. Highly recommend it. We're talking quite a harrowing childhood here. Then finding like family unity in the street gangs, the graffiti gangs of London. These guys are jumping on the trains, hiding under the trains, not paying, jumping over the barriers, causing chaos with the shopkeepers, tagging this, tagging that, and the rival gangs have all got knives. So this stuff is escalating and escalating. Then the X scene co comes around, they're all dropping E's, and um, Satanism starts. One of the gang members is a proper psycho doing all this Satanism in his room. And I'm only halfway through, so we're going to have to hand it over to Justin to hear what happens for the rest of it. But before we start with his, with his story chronologically, prior to setting the camera up, Justin was telling me about he was in this prison and there was an altercation with this guy who was in for extremely serious offence. So thanks for coming on, Justin. Thanks. What year was this and what prison was this? This was probably 2003 um and it was hmyoi Owsbury in buckinghamshire which was a young offenders institution for 18 to 21 year olds serving four years to life so you can imagine if they're in that age group um the lifers were in for some well, obviously serious murders um and a lot of them had attention in the press and stuff for their crimes so it was a uh, um a place that was on edge full of like young men with like basically nothing to lose or that they saw no future so it was a dangerous dangerous place right and you said there was a lot of lifers in there yeah there was a life uh, yeah there was a lot of lifers people doing um time for murder horrific horrific crimes um there was one guy i can think of i won't say his name for um obvious reasons but I was on this prison unit. I was settled on the unit um, and I would think I was a cleaner or something. And I noticed the other cleaners on the unit um, going up to this new guy that was on the on the unit. Um, and there was really friendly with him. I just kept my eye on him. And then like he was a, he was really jokey with them. And say around a few days later, he starts being jokey with me. But. I wasn't the sort of person that could take a joke back then or I didn't know how to sort of take a joke and I was thinking, why does this guy keep joking me? I didn't like it. It made me feel sort of on, on edge. When you say he was making a joke with you then, what was he saying exactly? You know, so, like, because I never really knew him and he's coming up to me going, ah, oh, you're a joker and like doing like things with his fists and stuff. It was just making me feel like uncomfortable. <laughs> you know, you don't know the guy. Um, and then I learned that he was in for murder um, and attempted murder. He he had thrown two people off of a off of a bridge of a bridge um and i think they had that they had attacked these two guys him and a group of people had attacked these two guys and then they were unconscious and then they picked him up and they threw him off of a bridge That's cold. one of them just drowned because he was unconscious and the other one woke up floating like I think his backpack was holding him up and he woke up and he was floating down a big river. I won't name the river, but it was a it was big, London, strong it, river. Yeah, basically, yeah. Um, and it was, yeah, obviously all over the news and that at the time. They were just random people they came across. Yeah, random people just like that, crossing the bridge and then like dead. Well, one was dead and the other one woke up floating down down the river. So um, yeah, this was in my mind and this guy's coming up to me, joking with me, making me feel a bit uncomfortable. And then it must have been about a week later, we was on association uh, where all the prisoners are getting to associate and I'm playing pool and he's, I look over and he's just sitting there staring at me. And then he's like, prankster. And then I think, oh, don't call me a prankster. And he just jumped up and just ran over to me and was like, what? And then I, I had a broken tooth, a sharp broken tooth, and he just, just out of nowhere, just ran up to me and just head butted my tooth. <sighs> like, I rattled, I dropped to the floor, I got up with a pool cue and I started chasing him and his head was like pissing out with blood where he had caught the sharp tooth. The screws come running in um, and grab him and they take him, take him away. Um, I never got him with the, with a pool cue and then that was all gone. He went to segregation unit and we all got put back in our cells. Don't know what it was, but when you're in a prison cell, you know, 
sometimes 24 hours a day, you've got nothing else to think about. So I'm just analyzing the situation, thinking, right, this guy's just gone nuts over me just saying, don't call me a prankster. He's already killed, serving a life sentence, he's gonna come back and kill me. Mm. And then like, I, I, I think I couldn't sleep that night. I was, it was just weird. Like it just overtook me, like anxiety and paranoia. And then I was thinking, oh my God, he's going to come back. It's going to come back to the wing. He's going to kill me. I need to be ready. Um, and then for two weeks, I literally couldn't sleep. I was like worrying about it, thinking this guy is going to do me. And then the screws come and they said, right, um, so-and-so is coming back to the unit. We've spoke to him. He's going to behave. He ain't got problem with you. He shake your hand. I'm like, yeah, fine. I'm, I'm, I'm working on the server, um, serving up food and people are coming from the right hand side and I'm thinking, right, it's going to come around here any, any second. Um, and obviously no one knows I ain't been sleeping for, for, for two weeks. And then I'm looking around the corner, one prisoner, two prisoners, and then he's there and he walks around the corner and he's just staring at me, just standing there, like just staring at me with his eyes. Right. Um, I never knew the impact just that stare, those eyes would have on me. That was 2003. What was what it? Was it now? We're 40, 14, 15 years later, and today I still have a problem with eyes. If say I walk around the corner and I see like an ag like an aggressive man or something in South London, and he like looks at me with his eyes, or someone looks at me, I I I used to go nuts. Like I need to kill that person because yeah. it reminded me of that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's still on odd occasion it can freak me out. But we're come more to that so i started um i'm thinking this guy he, he's playing a game he ain't gonna he, he's gonna kill me like this yeah. guy's gonna kill me right and then um you know days and weeks pass and i'm literally thinking about it constantly he's working on the estate party meaning that he goes off the unit and moves bins around and i'm a cleaner and i work on service so he's passing me each time mm. and then um i started losing the plot like um, I was in my cell and I started having an OCD and counting all these numbers and stuff in my head. Mm. And his prison cell number was like, it was on the twos, the twos landing. So it's 217. I still know it today, still see the number. It, it jumps out to me. Um, so I was like obsessed with these numbers and like, um, I'm walking around my prison cell, going, touching things five times. Um, and my mind was telling me like, if you don't touch it five times, this guy's gonna kill you. And all this weird stuff starts happening. And like, I, like say channel five was on, I couldn't watch channel five. Like that, that's how, <laughs> that's how like crazy it was. And then like, I would have to, and then, and then I started thinking, oh my God, this guy's like, we share all the same blankets, the, the prison, they be washed. And then I'm thinking, oh, he's like energy and all this weird stuff has taken over my mind. His energy's on the, he's used this blanket. I need to wash my hands. He's touched this. And then I was like washing my hands, touching things five times. And then it was just like, I literally just like, ex like exploded, like mental health wise, just like exploded. I didn't know what to do. It's not like I can go and tell like a screw or something. I'm losing, losing the plot. Um, anyway, it comes up that he's going to be moved to an adult prison, but my mind already told me like he might move to an adult prison but he's still here and he's still going to get you in your mind. Um, I started becoming, he, so he moved. I started becoming really violent. Um, if anybody said the wrong thing to me, my way of coping with it was if I don't attack them and beat them physically and win, then I'm going to go back to my cell and it's going to be another one of those killers in my mind. That was my coping, coping mechanism. So any, you know, like back chat or joke out of hand, I would have to attack first and be satisfied that I scared the living daylights out of that person or I won the fight. Otherwise, they would be in my mind. Um, did any of those fights drag out? Yeah. Uh, sorry? Did any of those fights drag out? Um, uh, what, what do you mean? Yeah. Like, so you felt you had to instigate. Yeah. So you're having fights, multiple fights with people. Yeah, now, yeah. And did yeah. you have long, were there any long battles that you had there, with people then over that? There was a that? guy, there was a big Northern guy, um, Apparent people you say that he was in for like sexual offenses, but there was no proof, right? But so people didn't like him anyway, but he was a big, big guy. Um, and I was a skinny little guy at the time. And he he was where I had lost my job on the servery because my behavior was so erratic, and he worked on the servery. And I walked to the servery and 
they were handing out like bread or something. He just literally just threw it on my tray. It was like dickhead, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. And then obviously that goes into my head to kill. I'm like, fucking kill. I'm going to kill you. Get sent back to my cell. And then um, I said, like, no, nah, that's it. I've got to do this guy now. So I'm screaming out of the side of the door what I'm going to do to him. And then he knew that one of my teenage friends, like my best friend in my teenage years had passed away. So we started slagging off my friend to like wind me up. So um, I got I got a curtain tie and um, took the curtain tie off, made a hole in it and filled it with batteries. And then I was charging myself up. It had to be like two hours till association time. And then I was like, all right, that's it. Going to go out there. But I moved too soon. Where I was so like adrenaline pumped up and drained from getting charged up, he was playing pool. So I attacked him at the wrong time because obviously he had, a, he had a pool cue. So I, yeah, I started hitting him around the head with the batteries in a sock and then he snapped a pool cue around my jaw. Um, and then this time it was me taken off to the segregation unit. Um, when I came back, they told me that I was moving up to the up to the second landing and then i was like oh, this is my like controlled zone in my in my in my cell like my ocd zone and then i didn't want to move but then they moved me upstairs um and i was just on edge like oh my god what if that killer's been in the cell like all this stuff running through my head i finally started settling down in the evening like laying on a bed relaxing or trying to relax and i i, I done graffiti in my teenage years so um I know, like, I don't know, when it comes to, like, lettering and words and writing, scratching on walls and stuff, I I can see stuff fades and st it stands out to me from doing graffiti. So I'm laying there on my on my bed and then I'm looking to um, the cell door, just started to try and relax, and I can see someone's name carved in the cell door. And then I'm like, no, 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 it can't be. And I get up, get to the door, and I start looking at the scratch, the faded scratch, it's the killer's name. <sighs> So, so I was here and then I'm like oh fuck fuck and then like I'm like, oh, I'm like oh, go lay down on the bed I'm like fuck I can't lay on the bed he's been in the bed it's like sleeping with the fucking sleeping with the with the devil right so this is how my mental health just declined I started sleeping on a cold prison floor mm. um and the night officer would come around and they'd be like Rollins what, what, you all right mate what are you doing on the floor and I'd be like oh yeah I'm, I'm all right the, the bed's just un <laughs> the bed's just uncomfortable guff <laughs> I couldn't tell anybody what was going on. Um, but yeah, it finally exploded. I couldn't couldn't handle it anymore. I um I got the TV and I threw it off the ceiling, smashed, smashed TV, I got the glass, and I just started um like slicing up my arms and I put all my clothes, magazines and stuff up against the door. I set them on fire. Um and yeah, I was just like, I was at the lowest, lowest point. Um and then the screws come, fire brigade come. They took me over to the healthcare unit where I stayed for probably a few days. And then a really good officer come over to me and he said to me, say that you you was attempting suicide because otherwise you're going to get outside charge for arson. So I, I said that was a, an attempt on my life. So I didn't get any outside charges for arson, but I got took back to the prison unit and I had a piece of glass like stashed in my trainer or something. I was refusing to leave my cell and then they was like, right, we're taking you to the segregation unit. So I started back to the segregation unit. I'm like, F you, I, I don't care, right? So, but the segregation unit, there wasn't uh, windows that would open. It was just like plastic and was scratched to pieces. You could barely see out of it. So the air was tight in there. I had a lighter and glass. So once again, I'd start slicing my wrists um, and I set the tissue. It was only a toilet roll I set on fire. It was the only thing that was in there. But the smoke soon filled. Couldn't breathe. I'm pressing the, pressing the buzzer, like having a pan. It's like, gov, gov. I could hear the prison officer just plodding along. Opens up the eye, uh, the spy hole. I could just see his eye and he's just laughing at me. He could see the fire. There's not a fire. Or I've pulled it out and he just still just gets the fire hose, puts it through and just starts soaking me, like literally laughing. And that, like the smoke, which was making me like choke and be, not being able to breathe. And the the um, the pressure of the freezing cold fire hose was like pushing me back and I'm running back and forth for the back of the cell trying to avoid it. Eventually, the prison officers come with riot shields and I have to um, strip naked go to the back of the cell and put my nose to the to the door um sorry to the back wall 
and then the instructions the screw comes in and he puts the shield to my back and then i have to start walking out backwards uh, bear in mind i can't breathe properly and um i'm naked and f soaked and then i step out of the cell and he's like walk to the left put your nose up against the like the outside wall and then i'm walking out. i look to the left like that i look down and there's fire brigade and all nurses and stuff and when you're there basically naked you ain't been home for years because you're in prison it was like one of the lowest points like those fire brigade would have gone home and we're like yeah told their wife about this nutter that was kicking off down the segregation unit and it was just a yeah low low point but um after that when i finally went back to the prison unit out of segregation a nurse that was really nice he come had a word with me he said look rollins they're thinking about sectioning you and then like i probably had a year left on my prison sentence so that means if they section you in prison you're permanently in the mental health facility yeah and and then once you've done your time in the mental health deemed fit enough you come back to prison centers and finish off your year i said to him look could they send me to like broadmoor right and then he was like, of course they can send you to Broadmoor. He's like, we've had people from Broadmoor come back into this prison. And then like when he said the words Broadmoor and knowing his history and stuff, I was just like, I need to, he was basically giving me a warning, like, this is a heads up, you're one, your, your last chance. So after that, how much, no matter how hard it was, I had to get my head down with, with the mental health issues that had, that had developed. What had you heard about Broadmoor that made you spooked like that? Well, when I was in HMP High Down in Surrey, um, I had had this, there was like a little, they had just opened a young offenders unit. It's an adult prison, but there was a young offender unit and the young offenders were running crazy. Like the screws didn't know how to deal with them. They were obviously a lot, were a lot more chaotic than adult prisoners. Um, and I had a cellmate called Buster and he was just a nutter. He would sing out the window about people's mums and all this shit. So we always had people come into the cell the next day to come and get him. Um, so then I get caught up in this feud that he's got with people on the unit. And then like I'm like, I've got to get out of here, right? It, it was it was like there was a guy trying to come in with a razor. We're we're barricading our uh, door cell door, and the screw literally walking along. He knows what's going on. He just opens the door like. Like literally, I don't see the grin on his face, but he knows what's going on and he's just grinning. And then this big guy, Smithy, massive guy, he's like trying to get Buster and Buster's like singing and that like, behind the barricade and like, he, and then he's, and then this guy Smith's trying to do him with a razor. Like they wanted to do him more than they wanted to do me. And then I just couldn't handle it. I thought I need to get out of it. Right. So I fucking, I just, I uh, self-harmed and I got, got took down to the healthcare unit. And I've gone down to this healthcare unit and there's probably just a, just a long corridor and it's just quiet. It was like, oh my God, like peace. Like I've got some peace, right? There was no TVs or anything like that. And there was no other young offenders down on the healthcare unit. And I thought, no, this is good. This is like safety here. This is peace. I want to stay here. If I've got to keep acting crazy and self-harm or whatever, stay down here, I will. Um, so there's a story on the news at the time there's this guy that had um there's this guy on a run from basingstoke he had chopped his he had battered his best mate to death um, and he had chopped him up into pieces and threw his head in his head his friend's head was found in the neighbor's bush mm. um bits of his body was found in a park and then when the police knew it was him they was after him he flew out to new york got found in Central Park in New York reading the Sun newspaper. And people are going on about on the prison unit, right? Um, or on the healthcare unit. And then like some like one day someone's come to me, like this guy's been caught now, he's gonna be extradited back to the UK. Um, and then there's these gated cells on the prison, on the healthcare unit, it's gated cells. Like normal prison cells in England, the big steel heavy doors. But on the healthcare units, they have a couple of 24 hour watch cells, which are gated cells, which look like a more of a, like American old school you see in a movie with bars, right? And there was two and they were for people that were um, serious risk of self-harm or for like category A prisoners that have got high profile trials going on and, you know, they don't want them to kill themselves during trial or whatnot. 
So then I get put in one of them for some reason, and then someone comes up to the bars and goes, mate, do you know who's here? Do you know that guy that chopped up that, um, his mate and that? And I'm like, what the one in the paper? It's like, yeah, I've been listening to it on the radio. Um, and yeah, come who comes plodding along Richard Markham, um, and he's like really happy. He's like in this, he's in a British prison now and he moves into the cell next door to me and I'm the only young offender there. There's not really meant to be young offenders there, but the prison system don't know what to do because they've only just opened up the young offender unit. Um, and there's a, just a tiny like bar, like where, where, the, um, where the cells join, there's just a tiny gap. So you could just sit there and chat, chat through the fence and then um, just chat through the gate. So Richard became my friend um, and I was reading a book at the time, Roy Shaw's um, book, I can't remember what it's called, Pretty Boy Roy Shaw, and he's talking about Broadmoor and I would tease Richard saying, ah, you're going to go Broadmoor, mate. And he's like, no, no, I'm not, I'm not. And then um, and then he would, tell me, he would tell me the ins and outs of his case and he actually got his friend's arm, put it in the oven and cooked his cooked his friend's arm and um he showed me the diagrams you know like the layout of the crime scene from the police and he stabbed the fork in his friend's cooked arm and hot fat spat out in his face um anyway i was um being held next to this guy um i'll tease him saying he's going to broadmoor and en route to Owsbury, i got moved to wood hill just being held there um while my space came up in Owsbury. And I got a letter and it said, I opened up the letter and there was a little blue slip and it said, this mail has been thoroughly checked by the staff at Broadmoor. Um, and then it was a letter from Richard and he had, he, like I told him he would end up in Broadmoor, but he had, I think he had thrown sh hot water uh, with sugar in someone's face or something. Um, and then, so fast forward when I'm in Owsbury and I was warned by the nurse that I could be sectioned and they said I could go to Broadmoor. And then I thought, nah, that's it. Get my head down now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow, man. You're bloody brilliant at telling harrowing, disturbing stories. That's like, I'm <laughs> got, so gripped. Mate, I've, got, I've got plenty more, man. I've got plenty more. I, I was in, I, I haven't told the story, but. Like, oh, when I was moved to HMYY, no, no, sorry, HMP Wood Hill, um, and they had a young offender unit, but they had had a young offender unit for some years. They knew how to handle young offenders. So being from South London, I saw Wood Hill was like a northern prison, but then there was guys from like Birmingham, Liverpool, and they saw that as like a southern. Um, and there was only a few London guys there on, on the unit, and there was a guy um from east from leighton stone and uh, so we paired up so like can we share a cell so screws let us share a cell and after each um we would watch eastenders after after eastenders finish and the you know the end of it the like the um the outro that like, like everyone would yeah <laughs> everyone would like kick the hell out of their cell door it was just like ritual for like <laughs> for like five minutes afterwards um Mm. it was yeah it was crazy like coming away for that for a second everyone as well would at night would howl out of the windows like we'd everyone would do different noises yeah so you'd have like sheep um big dogs little dogs like horses cats like just and then people would start burning stuff and throwing out the window and there was loads of rubbish below the window so there was always fires um and uh see like whitener coffee whitener that that's actually flammable so you would light the, your coffee whitener um so yeah you're looking out and there's fires and there's like all of these crazy noises going on but after east end is everybody's kicking the door and then me and um my friend from leytonstone we were trying to impress each other or try to be the loudest we're kicking the door then we start smashing the door in with a chair and then we just start smack. We, we got so hyped, we just start smashing the glass through, um, which the screws look through. And um, it was like once it all calmed down, I thought, oh, fuck, we're gonna go, we're gonna go segregation unit now for criminal damage. Um, and then I come up with the idea, like, look, I've self-harmed and that in the past. Why don't why don't I self-harm a little bit? 
and then you start banging on the door and then you say you were so scared you smashed the glass neither of us would get in trouble <laughs> so that was the plan right so we started doing it but i obviously had something wrong with me like mentally at the time that i started seeing how scared he was when i self-armed so then i started doing it even more like we can go to my obviously we go back to like my childhood with my gangs and the crazy shit we used to do but that sort of behavior was like normal so seeing the fear it just made me like feel like crazy and powerful and then i started like he he knocks on doors the screws get him out and then i start throwing a chair like kicking off and like tying stuff around my neck covering myself in blood like it just went a bit crazy man and then all of a sudden i i hadn't been done with uh by a by screws of a prison shield before that was later on in Aylesbury. so this was i wasn't expecting it i didn't know what was to come and all of a sudden the door just swung open and they just had a right shield. they just come in just smash me to the floor and i sort of rolled under the bed and they just dragged me out uh, ripped my arms so far up behind my back and up and they're bending my hands but i was so charged up i was like yeah like this is like like wicked and then everyone's cheering me on all the the ones that bang after eastenders like leave me alone like kicking the door and then right that's it i mean i don't know where i am i mean like hmp wood hill don't really know the prison all the screws have got me and it's like well it's the evening now and they're just walking through the prisons obviously locked down and they're taking me through all of these like corridors or outside and i don't know where i am and then i'm bent over the whole time like looking up to see where i am they take me into like this weird building it's like an office in the middle and it's like a circle of cells and i'm working out this must be the healthcare unit um and then i look over to the left and then i can see a boarded up area and then i'm like me why are they taking me in in there they're gonna fucking kill me or something they take me through this boarded up with a made-up door that's attached and that they take me in there and then there's three of them gated cells a 24-hour watch cells one of them was empty i was put in the middle one and the one on the left in the furthest corner there was obviously a wall there um and then there was a female officer there was a table loads of like paperwork computer all sorts of stuff and there was someone being held in there and I'm thinking like, oh, I weren't thinking nothing of it at the time. Put me in my cell and then a prison officer sitting outside the gate and they're taking it in turns to watch me. Now in my mind, I'm at war with them. Really, I'm just at war with myself. Um, but I'm at war with that prison officer. I need to break him mentally. So I put blood from my wounds over my face and I cover myself in this white blanket and I just walk around in a trance for say like an hour just mumbling all this stuff while looking at him like I am have to break him. Like, that. That's <laughs> like I have to break him, make him scared or whatever. Like in my mind, my fucked up mind at the time, that was my way of winning. Anyway, when it calmed down, went to bed, woke up in the morning and then was like looking at my new surroundings. Arms are sore from wounds and being bent up. I'm thinking, oh, I've got this feeling inside me of like anxiety and something going right here. And I, these doors, like these gated cells, they came out at an angle so you could sort of step out a little bit and look to your right. So I thought, nah, something came right with that table and that there and that officer there. So I stepped out, looked to the right and I looked at the name board and it said Huntley category Cat A. And I was being held next to Ian Huntley, who was being held in Wood Hill, and he was going to go on. I don't know if he pleaded guilty, but he was up for killing the two, the Sower murders, killing the two young girls. And yeah, I was yeah basically held in that. And I'd literally just turned eighteen, and um, obviously with going on what I've been going on, I had like mental health issues, and it just I didn't know how to take it. It just fucked me up even more. Then I maybe a day or so later, I started like opening my wounds, really frustrated. Um, and then the devil was like, started speaking to me, excuse me, mate, excuse me. Like, cause the officer's telling me to stop it. And then Huntley was trying to tell me, excuse me, mate, if you stop, I'll give you some um, tobacco. And it was two female, it was a theme, I think two female nurses. But looking back now, he was just trying to show that there was some sort of humanity there. But obviously the guys are, uh, absolute beast man but 
that was um hmp woodhill man and then i think when i finally got to call my my family and i told them where i was being held next to huntley the prison um denied it and i was and they moved me straight away did you talk to huntley much that was that was that was basically it mate you tried to talk to me but i can't i could sit here over exaggerate oh yeah but that that was it man but looking back it did have a fucking Im impact on my already like um what was the nature thing. of what he did? I can't remember. He he Why? he killed two he killed two young girls in yeah. Soham. He was a caretaker. Oh, um, that's the one. Yeah, yeah, caretaker, yeah. and him and his girlfriend Maxine Carr. Um, well, I don't she, I don't think she she wasn't she didn't kill them, but she, she was convicted for something to do with because there was a huge man wasn't there? Yeah, don't yeah, know done it. Yeah, and he was on he was on camera um, on the news, like being interviewed, saying, "Are oh, the poor girls this and that." One only one thing is when a prison officer came over to, from the young offender unit to take turns to watch me to make sure I don't self harm, and then he was saying, "Where are you from, Justin?" And I said, oh, "South London." Who do you support? I say Chelsea, and then but I know he's over there. He's volunteering to look after me so they can see the beast. It's obviously big talk in the prison, um, and then he's like, "Who do you support, um, Huntley?" And then he said, "Man United," and that's the that, that them little girls are wearing Man United tops. Or in, the, or in the in the photo of them, they're wearing Man U tops. Oh. Yeah, but yeah, dark, dark time, really dark time. So you had a lot of confrontations with the guards. Yeah. Was have you described that was the worst, or was there a worst one that you had? Um, probably just just that the the description of when I was in the um prison um in the segregation unit when the officer was looking through and his eye and he was laughing and obviously i felt like i couldn't breathe and i was gonna die and he sprang me with a hose that's probably the the most darkest one the others were just like yeah my sort of minor but that was the one that stuck with me because it's the whole eye thing you know, I haven't got any privacy in prison like any per you could be laying on your bed and a random person could just like a random prison or officer any person member of staff can look through and just stare at you don't even know who they are it's just an eye watching you do you know what i mean so it sticks with you how much of the book is prison stories um that the stories i just said about woodhill and uh Owsbury are from a follow-on book that's not published yet but in the the Lost Boys, there's small stories of going in and out of young offenders institutions and Richard Markham comes at the end and then that's sort of where the book ends. Um, so it's, it's the following book, that's mo mostly prison. The first book, The Lost Boys, is basically gangs and street life and just the crazy stuff that goes on. So if you want to get Justin's book, Lost Boys, the link is in the description box below this video. I got it on my Kindle, so I'm assuming it's going to be available worldwide on Amazon as an ebook. So let's go back then to how this all started then, like where you grew up and how you fell into this gang lifestyle. Yeah, so um, I grew up early 80s in south southwest London, Surrey. Yes. It, where I grew up in Sutton is Surrey, but it's still the London borough of Sutton. And it basically borders Southwest London. Um, I grew up there. Uh, my mum was, my mum's mixed Anglo Indian and English, but f English name looks white to me. Um, all of her sisters white to me, all of my cousins white. My dad, was mixed anglo burmese and dutch burger dutch burger is a small catholic community in sri lanka um so they're obviously english speaking english dressed um but my dad wasn't around so i just grew up with my mum and my large white family so from the beginning well not saying from the beginning i, I was different i felt i was different and um because of the color of my skin um and my mum would send me to this childminders and I was probably about five years old and like life's good, life's normal. I'm just a little boy going to school and one day the childminders son just comes down and gets out some uh, fishing wire and just starts strangling me and um, 
I'm like crying my eyes out, terrified. Mm -hmm. And there was a boy there with special needs. Um, after he was taking it in turns of strangling us, he was strangling, I think his name was Chris, he had special needs, strangling him. And then Chris weren't crying. And in my confused state, even though it's five years old, looking back, it was like I was confused on why am I crying? And this this guy is not. So he didn't know how to express what was going on. Um, I think I told the child minder, like, like your son's like strangled me i think he must have been about 15 and then she was like calling the boy with um i oh know calling me a wuss okay you're wuss because the because uh, the other boy weren't even crying and i remember being like locked out on a balcony by them and like loads of teasing and mental torture For some reason my mum was still putting me in that care and around the same time like just say like the months after that i started doing violent violent things um which i i put down to to the incident that was happening to me so i would be in the local playground the kids are playing out on it we lived on an estate at the time and i'd like throw stones into the playground like from afar and watch them hit ki other kids heads and like we'd call it like cracking their head open i cracked my head open um and then i got a deaf and dumb boy um was well, it's probably not the correct term now but we used to say it was called deaf and dumb back in the day um and I grabbed the kid, bear in mind I'm only like five or six, and I got him and threw him down stairs and then I ran off. His parents were like knocking down my mum's door and I was just blamed it on the girl that lived next door. I started doing like, like uh, I think we killed, like me and the neighbor, we killed all of her fish and I was going to school and I was um, stealing kids' toys, like loads of stealing was going on. But the thing is, I wouldn't keep the toys. I'd give the, always give them to other kids. Um, eventually, my mum and my stepdad, they had saved up enough and they bought a house and we moved away. Um, but I was already on a different path because of the incident that happened to me. And I started... Um, there was a bus stop opposite my house and I'd get my toy cars and I'd put them under the bus wheels and watch the car, uh, watch the bus like crunch them and it would make me feel really good. And then I started setting fires, um, smashing windows, all the sorts of like traits of like becoming a psychopath. Um, and my, I didn't have contact with my dad, but his parents would come to see me sometimes and they would take me up to a museum in London and stuff. And once I was on the train going past like an abandoned train carriage, which was covered in graffiti and signatures, I said to my gra I said to my granddad, what's that? And he said, it's graffiti, it's a form of criminal damage. But with my destructive mind, it was just like, whoa, this is it. I saw that image, these people risked their lives. And that was it, I found something that this is what this is what I wanted to do. Um, so like the following, say say the following school week, went into school and I stole a teacher's whiteboard marker, and I went down to the local bridge and I started writing stuff on the bridge. Come back the next day to show my friends, but it was gone because it was a whiteboard. It weren't a permanent marker, so the rain had washed it away. And even at that age, I was probably about ten then. I started to try and create a ga gangs. Um, so I had CVP which stood for Culver's Vandal Posse, RLB, Ruthless Boys, and MFP, Motherfucking, motherfucking Prostitute was my gang name, and I was the only person in this gang. Um, I tried to round up other kids, but they weren't really into the graffiti thing, but eventually um, I attracted kids that are into the same thing as me. Um, I met other kids slightly older that were doing graffiti and then they soon taught me that you have to do graffiti at like not down your alley got hit train stations and so they taught me something called bushwhacking which meant you would sit in a bush um you'd go off the railway pla off the train platform sit in a bush and when the train pulls up you'd quickly run cross the tracks and you'd write your name i literally couldn't even reach the train i was so small and we would hit the victoria bound so it was put to me then that look you wrote your tag on there your name is now going into the city and other graffiti writers in the city are going to see see your name and it was like for the first time um i found an identity because i didn't literally didn't know who i was the area i was grew, grew grew up in was a pretty racist place at the time um then something with a dog as well did you yeah yeah i was attacked i think i was probably about three years old 
I was at my stepdad's and he had a Doberman. Um, if you know a Doberman, they were like bred for guarding duty. So it's really a one man dog. You can have it as a family pet, but it's, it was bred for guarding. Um, and I was in my stepdad's and I was playing with my ball. And anytime the ball went to the dog, my stepdad would get the ball. My stepdad had like disappeared for a few minutes and I just walked over to get the, the ball and then bang, the dog just got me around the head. Um, he just missed my eye and then I've still got the jaw marks across my head, the bottom jaw wow. and the top jaw, wow. like bang, bang like that. And it was just swinging me around like a rag doll. Um, yeah, so <laughs> so yeah, I was attacked by the, by the dog, put in hospital, she could have died. Um, that was a disturbing, the disturbing thing, an early disturbing thing in my childhood. So from three to five, you went from some hella, hellacious stuff. Yeah, um, and so weird looking back now that the dog wasn't even put down. And anytime I went over to my stepdad's house, the dog was just put in the conservatory. So I was sat one side of the glass and the dog was sat the other side. And I'm playing with my toys and he's just staring at me and it's the eyes again. The eyes just looking at me, looking at me. So like the trauma and the whole thing with eyes and that was getting embedded in my brain from, from that early. Then I had something called, um, Ju I think it's called pronounced Julian Barr syndrome, where I couldn't, all of a sudden I couldn't walk. Like I was paralyzed for like six months. It's like a disease that attacks your um, nervous system. And then I was in children's hospital and that was a for me a dark and disturbing place being with kids on like a unit like it was it was like prison when i look back now how old um, were you in the children's hospital i was probably about four or five mm -hmm. there um i don't know if my mum stayed there with me every night but looking back at some weird stuff i can just see like like a disabled kid attacking a member of staff or something a kid with special needs or something it was yeah it was a weird dark place I would just crawl under the beds with my Ghostbuster toys. Um, and then I started banging my head to go to sleep. I would lay on my front and I'd just smash my head on the pillow continuously until I fell asleep. And as I started waking up the next day, I'd, I was waking up, smashing my head and then I'd awake. And that was called a uh, rhythmic movement disorder. Mm -hmm. Nobody picked it up, but from researching myself, it can come from tra a brain trauma. And nobody picked that up that it could have been from brain damage from dog or dog attack or something. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. So, you go through all this shit. Yeah. Um, you feel, you're experiencing the racism on top of it all. There's a lot of words they're using again on you in the, in the book. Yeah. And um, then you click up with the graffiti gang and that, that kind of becomes your family. Yeah. So, you're like just a junior one now. So, how does that escalate? Well, um, I moved away from that that area. Like, I'm, we moved again, and we moved to Malden, which was um, like southwest London. And I met other graffiti taggers or writers. Um, one of them was called Joe. His tag became Bath. Uh, he became my best friend. And my cousin Tony, he joined us. Um, and then there was Nemzar, and there was Ches. Um, so there's a group of us now and we're just writing our tags, getting on the trains, going out, stealing spray paint and stealing alcohol, like skipping school. And there was, at that age, you would look up to this other graffiti. There's a big graffiti gang. They're still around in London today. Or say a, a graffiti crew. A lot of people don't like it being called a gang, like a collective of writers, graffiti taggers and artists. And they were called DDS, which stood for Diabolical Dubsters. And they lived the graffiti lifestyle. The graffiti lifestyle was basically hanging around the rail network and the underground, stealing spray paint and graffiti equipment and plot in where you're going to go paint that night if you're going to do like a paint a long stretch of railway or climb into a tube depot train depot that was the the lifestyle and most kids wanted to be in in dds um but where we was forming a group it was like oh let's start our own um let's start our own graffiti crew so we called ourselves wz which stood for warriors warriors with a z on the end instead of an s and start writing it around around that part of southwest london and 
there was another graffiti crew slash gang from the Kingston area and they were called WK. And um, I knew them, but I didn't really think much of we were writing WZ. I'm just with my friends now. Um, and then messages were getting sent across saying, tell I had created the tag 706 and the street name Sevens for short. Tell Sevens he wants to stop writing WZ because it sounds too much like our, our crew. Um, but where I'm with my friends and I'm, I'm only 14 and I'm like, yeah, FWK. Um, and then we start putting lines for each other's initials, which is basically set in the, um, the like pace, the tone for a, for a confrontation. Um, so I'm like acting like the big man in front of my friends and like FWK, blah, blah, blah. There was another gang called um, SK, which should for sh which stood for Shadow Crew. And they're from like the Wallet and Croydon area. And I knew some of them. They came down to Malden where we were hanging around and were saying, yeah, we've had a fight with WK at a party. SK like soon disappeared the name and these guys joined WZ. All of a sudden there's like, you know like 10 15 wz and it was going to grow bigger because the more we was writing wz on walls around say four or five towns or a few different boroughs the other kids wanted to come and join us and see what all the fuss was around so we was building a gang and then i was tiny but somehow i, I was finding myself like the leader of of this um so i'm saying yeah i know where wk hang around in new malden Let's go down there and get them. Like I'd done violent things in my early childhood, like the throwing stones and stuff like that, but I'd never arranged anything like this. Um, I didn't even think it was going to happen. Do you, at 14, do you think that it's going to happen? Like, no, like uh, come Friday, like four o'clock, I look around and there is, I think, I think maybe 15 to 30. I can't remember because we used to, when we would arrange gang fights, we would actually count, like, right, how many people we got together? One, two, and we're looking down the bus counting. Like, we were so proud of the numbers we could get. But yeah, there was either like 15 or, or 30 guys. One of my friends turned up called um, Crazy Steve. I was 14. He was probably like 13, but he looked like a man at 13. He had big, hairy chest, big guy crazy guy and his dad had made him a weapon for this fight like <laughs> so his dad's um his dad has made him half a broomstick which has been shaved or shaved down into a point on one side so that's a spike um and the other side is screws with a stanley blade coming out the end of it um steve's turned up for this fight and um pulls out the the weapon and then everyone's i'm like wow, like we actually have to go and do this now um so we're waiting for buses to get down to that the area new malden and every time a bus driver saw us he just put his foot down he thought i'm not letting them on eventually we managed to get onto the bus <laughs> get down to new malden there's a few boys from battersea there more hardened kids and i didn't know that they had knives and stuff on them and we're walking down the alley and then because I'd been shouting my mouth off for, you know, a week or so, yeah, I want to do this, do that, or for weeks actually, um, get down this alley, there's a, probably about five WK members just sitting there on a bong smoking hash. So they were like stoned and like monged out anyway. And then someone, someone seeing was like, seven, sevens. That was my street name. And they were like, seven, set it, set it. And then I was just like, I'd picked up a piece, just a lump of concrete. And I looked at the guy in front of me and he was a graffiti writer that I knew and that I was all right with him. But I was with my gang. So I had to, I just started hitting him around the head with a piece of concrete. Um, he was screaming, nah, nah. And then crazy Steve just pulled out his tool that his dad had made and started hitting some boy around the head with it. And then... The Battersea boys started stabbing people in the legs and ar um, arse and stuff. And then everyone just scattered in different directions. Me and Crazy Steve got out of there. When we was well out of the area, he pulls out the tool and looks at it. And on the end of the screws, there was bits of flesh and hair. Um, we got back to base in Malden. And that was when I became like, I'd, I made made my decision. That was it. I felt like I was with my my brothers, my crew, I just felt like I was, I, f I was something. Like I went from a bullied kid trying to show off into a violent, violent person. 
Yeah, yeah and reading the book, there was an altercation with Somalis. Oh, uh, yeah, the, the Somali gang. that story. The Somali gang from South Wimbledon. Oh. So me and um, my friend Bath, Joe, we was we were just tr troublemakers. Like, Malden's our town now. Um, we had WZ sprayed all over the walls. So this, we was marking out our territory. We, there, back then, there weren't a lot of CCTV, but there was a cancel CCTV. There was something like 12 cameras. Uh, so we knew where each camera was. This was this is our base. This is our home. Like if someone comes here, we're gonna just random kids. We're gonna just attack you or confront you for being in our area. Don't understand how kids, you know, why you're trying to claim this. But we felt like we were something. This is this is our life. This is our home. So we're just off of the high street. There's a row of houses, and there's a girl there called Gemma that she used to hang around with us sometimes. We would always have like beef and you know, slanging matches with her. And then there was two Somalian boys on the doorstep. Um, they were from South Wimbledon. We sort of knew one had confrontations before and they were older and they were row like rowdier. They were ready. And then we're like cussing Gemma and they're like giving it to us. But our friend, little Adam lived around the corner and he was like a collector of like weapons, all sorts of shit, like nunchuckers, machetes, swords. So we're just like, we want not going to use them, but we're going to little Adam's like, give us a, give us a, give us a sword, give us a, yeah. We just walk down, we're like, yeah, whoa, whoa. And then the Somalians are like, they, they know that they can beat us physically, but then we knew the intimidation straight away, pull out the machetes and stuff. They run. We're so reckless. Um, little Adam's dad's coming home from work. He pulled, just, what the fuck? <laughs> Jumps out the car, takes the swords and that off of us. He's fuming. <laughs> And we just go on our way, right? So we're just hanging around alleys and and stuff in Malden, drinking. We've just oblivious to like what we had just done. It was just like the normal uh, madness. And then we're walking along. Actually, I split up with Bath. He goes one way in Malden. I'm going some long way, like 20 minutes to get back around to the high street. I'm with little Adam. Someone phones my phone. Or like it's like fifty one tens back then. Sometimes like the Somalian boys, they're in um they're in Malden, they're looking for you, yeah. So we're like, oh shit, like let's go down some back alleys and like have a little sneak to look down to the high street. So me and little Adam walk round, go up this alley, and then we look right, can't see them. We walk a bit further, then we see them. They're coming down the high street. They're about fifteen. They're like men, yeah. And fifty of them. About fifteen, 15. about fifteen. They're like men, right? Um. And we like little boys. I'm like, fuck, right? So we run back, run back down the alley. But for some reason, we don't run on down the alley and get onto this road and go. We do another side alley, which is a dead end, the corner of the Malden Tube Depot and the back of some restaurants. And we're like, oh, fuck, like, shit. Um, we can't, like, step out now. We're standing there thinking, are oh, they going to come down here? They're going to come down here. I just look to the alley. This Somalian guy walks past. He literally just looks at us, goes, and it bangs. And then we're like, <laughs> they're there. And we're in a dead end, yeah? I swear down, if it wasn't for quick thinking, we would have been killed. They had tools, weapons in them, would have been killed. I just saw about that much of a door open, yeah? I just ripped the door open. I'm in the back of an Italian uh, restaurant. The chefs and that are in there. <sighs> People having their lunchtime menu. I'm like, little Adam just follows me. Just run through the restaurant, past the people that are eating on their lunch breaks and that. Smile like 15 smiling, charging at us with um, <laughs> bats and poles and shit. <laughs> right, and then we just rip the front door open and I just start running, run around into Iceland. And this is where like, fuck, the security hated us in Iceland because we're always robbing and stealing. He's like, get the fuck out. But we just ran past him. We were up, we've gone into the storeroom. Only a couple of the Smiley boys ran through and into the storeroom to try and get us. Like We're hiding out there. That he goes. And then I look out through the window. And at the same time, some WZ members from Stockwell and Brixton, they had just got off of the um, tube. Ooh. And then... And then all of a sudden, I see Bath walking across the road like this. Not, I don't even think he knows anybody's about then. Bang, he's getting rushed. We run out and our Stockwell boys come charging across the road and their numbers are evened up. Like all the pub geezers come out. They're drinking their beer, cheering. All, tra all traffic come to a standstill and that was it, man. There was carnage, man. There was carnage. We like out, somehow outweighed them and people bottles like, i mean like, i was getting my hand bottled by my own friends like, i'm punching and my hands getting bottled all of a sudden 
I know, little Adam's walking along, a smiley guy smashing around the head with a brick. He's out cold on the floor. A car pulls up. Little Adam's br brother-in-law, a lot older, big man, and Crazy Steve jump out with baseball bats, yeah? Come charging. And then it was just like, bang, bang, bang. People drop into the floor. And then the 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 uh, Little Adam's brother-in-law just scooped him onto the shoulder, threw him in a car. They were off. And yeah, it was crazy. There were sirens going off, like shop alarms. People setting the shop alarms off and everything come to a standstill. And we all ran off. We climbed into Malden Tube Depot. We was hiding there. And then, yeah, a lot of people went... Um, to hospital and about five people went to prison only one of the smiley guys went to prison four wz members went to prison for that it was the charge was violent disorder yeah <laughs> before we get to the satanism of crazy steve then there was a woman young woman who told you she got pregnant <laughs> oh, yeah. her mum ends up getting stabbed later on by somebody yeah just want to set the scene for that one how you met that girl um, I would have just met um, Danielle. I'd have just met her just from around the local streets, just like me, like just on on the street, allowed to do what she wants to do. Um, I'd go out of her from time to time, and then when we would fall out, she'd call me horrible names, yeah, you, you packy and this and that, which really hurt me because all because I because. You know, I just wanted to fit in an uh, English name, English upbringing, English family. And that always got to me. So when she would say that, I like, had a, yeah, I was chaotic. She was chaotic. Um, So, yeah, Danielle, she would be with quite a few members uh, of the gang. And she was on and off girlfriend. So you want me to go into... Yeah, yeah, go into as much detail as you can, yeah. So basically, um, like life's moving on in WZ without stealing, without traveling around the London underground, uh, Robin. And um, Danielle says to me, says she's pregnant, yeah? And then I'm thinking, fuck, I'm probably like 15 or something now. And if I'm going to be a dad at 15. I didn't know how to handle it. It's like, I just... and she comes with this picture of this scan, yeah, baby. And then I'm just like, fuck, I'm actually going to be a dad. Um, and I remember having a scan on me and I was... I was coming in or out of Ballam Station. I had a stolen phone on me, brand new in a box. Get pulled by the police. They know who I am and that. And then I'm like, they're like, whose phone is this? Obviously, I'm saying it's mine. Someone bought it for me. And then I'm like, look, I'm going to be a dad. And then I show them the picture and they're like, oh, good. They let me go. And they're like, good luck on being a dad and that. Anyway, like the time comes. I know I was saying, I was going, I was fucking mental. And I'm saying to Danny, that ain't my kid, you slag, all this crap get her dad phoning me up big skinhead guy like and he's going you fucking that's my daughter you got pregnant you better be a dad after a while i was like dawn's me right i'm gonna be a dad so i go to the hospital with danielle and her mum and i'm sitting there in um like where she had a scan and that and then and then the nurse nurse says like oh you're nine weeks pregnant or 12 weeks so I was sitting there, thinking like calculating out the dates and stuff, thinking, nah, something came right here. You know? <laughs> Work out, nah, it, dang. and she's looking at me like this. Her mum ain't got a clue what's going on, and she knows. <laughs> and then I find out it's her first scan. So I'm like, well, so who's, who the fuck is this other kid in, in the scan, right? Anyway, I lived on the same road as the hospital, yeah. I steamed out of the hospital. I was like, well, that hurt. Like, I ain't going to be a dad at 15. <laughs> and then I walk home. Like, no one's home. My mum's at work and I'm just sitting in the house. I, like, find a bottle of my mum's red wine. I'm just drinking the wine all day, really charged up and angry. About five o'clock, I look out the window and I'm like, that's Danielle and her mum pulling up in the car. I'm like, fuck, I actually got some decency. They're going to um, come and apologise to me, yeah? <laughs> they get out of the car, they cross over the road and they go to my mate um, Ashley's house. <laughs> and it was fucking Ashley's baby the whole time, so... Mm. Yeah. Right. And later on, uh, the mum ended up getting stabbed. How did that yeah. come about? Um, it's quite a difficult one to talk about. I'll, t I'll talk about it, but um, always a touchy one. So me and Danielle, we're still on and off. Like I forgive her for saying that. Um, she, did, she got rid of the baby in the end um, and then um, said that she only wanted it if it was mine. And then we still on and off and then i think it was um say new year's eve me bath um 
another guy and my cousin Tony, we were we got served, we was getting served in this pub. Bear in mind I'm probably 15, 16, getting served in this dodgy pub in Two Inn. And um me and Joe decide to go off to his house. And we're both drunk and we charge up, we're trying to impress each other. We start punching, like breaking holes in his like cover, his wardrobe and stuff, right? And then he gets out a razor. This was probably the first time I self-harmed. And he starts cutting his arm with a razor. I start cutting my arm, and we're like blood brothers now. And it's like charged up covered ourselves in blood and then we're like right because we was always acting crazy and like this psychology this like gang psychology is you've got to be sick and you've always got to be like people got to be scared you always got up the craziness so now it's like we're looking in the mirror and we're both covered in blood we both have shaved heads and stuff we're covered in blood, and we're just sitting on a the bus there's people all dressed up going out for new year's eve and we're just sitting there we start making our way to Tooting and we're seeing little gangs, little groups of different gangs going out, which we knew could absolutely batter us and and, and attack us, um, like batter us in a fight. So we were, because we were covered in blood, we were going over to them with our hoods up so they couldn't see our face. Like, what? What? And then they're like, what? Like they, 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 and then because there's only two of us and we're like small. And then when she pulled the hood back and they see the blood and then they're like, they, they just don't know what to do, right? So um, the night was set for something really dark and disturbing to happen. And we go back to this pub where um, we're meeting Tony and Keith. I think I called him Keith. I need to be careful. I think I called him Keith in the book. Um, so Tony and Keith are there. They see us walking with the blood. And I was like, what the, what's going on here? Um, so the mood was set. I was like, right, there's a party in uh, Rose Hill. Let's let's head to this party. Um, start heading up to this this party, and the night's just ticking on. It's probably about I don't know, maybe like twelve, one in the morning, and um, Keith's got a knife on him, and we walk down this road, and I can see a big couple of guys, um, and I can see Danielle screaming at them. She's down there, just go, yeah, my boys are here now. You're gonna get these men come running out of nowhere smash a bottle over Baff's head um, and we all run in different directions. Meet up down the high street, probably about 20 minutes later, all regrouped, Danielle's there, Baff's like, like pushed her, like, you fucking got me bottled. Blah, blah, blah. And then um, I'm like to her, look, let's fucking go away. Let's, let's call it a night, right? So take Danielle and her friend with me. We start walking up the road. We sit down on this wall I don't. I didn't know that Danielle had phoned up her mum. I look up the road. There's a car coming to that screaming, screeching. Pulls up. She's obviously pissed up. It's um, New Year's Eve. Get in a car, Justin. Get in a car, Danielle. We're gonna fucking get him. And then I'm thinking, I ain't gonna get him. That's my cousin, my mate Bath, and and another friend, right? So um, I'm like, nah, nah. I'm staying here, right? I'm staying here. Um, so I'm just sitting on this wall. Danielle and her friend get in the car with the mum. They drive off. I'm just sitting there, just like drained from the night. Um, phone starts ringing. Justin, come down. Run down. Uh, my mum's been stabbed. My mum's been fucking stabbed. I'm like, oh my God, what the, what's happened, right? I start running down. Put about a 10 minute run. Get down there. Danielle's mum's on the floor. She's been stabbed. What I learned is that she jumped out the car um just started attacking uh keith and where he's high on ecstasy and fucking alcohol and whatnot he's just pulled out a knife and he stabbed stabbed her i can't remember how many times he stabbed her but um yeah she she was taking the ambulance i went to hospital with her uh i went to hospital with danielle which weren't too far away and uh, her mum obviously survived and whatnot uh, the family's really upset dad's all crying and stepdad's all crying like they stabbed my stabbed my wife they stabbed my wife like, i just couldn't understand what was going on it was yeah bad bad time and then um keith ended up getting a life sentence for that um and they put bath away for like they were trying to do him for like gbh gbh sent for just pushing danielle it, they, obviously they've brought him in because of the seriousness of the stabbing but eventually he got um that case got thrown out against him and then about two three months after that uh bath was found dead in our in our manor 
Um, and then, yeah, that just really, really just sent me to, to rock bottom. I was in Feltham at the time, phoned up, phoned up his number, so I'd call him up all the time. And then a different person answered. I've been phoning the house for years and it would be his mum, his sister, his brother. It was a different voice. And um, there was like, uh, 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 Bath, like, Joe's not here. And then someone else got on the phone, like, Joe's dead. He was found um, dead in Almana. So I can't go too much into the details of how he was found and whatnot. But it was always sort of classed as a, as a suspicious death. So, yeah, I came out to, to that confusion and all, all the other craziness that went with it. So the Satanism with Crazy Steve came yeah. before I felt yeah. them. How did that? What happened there? So, um, so like the WZ mentality was, I don't even know if we would talk about it, but it would just happen. It was, we always had to outdo each other on the craziness, like the, the sickness, um, the violence escalated and you always had to like gain, uh, respect and status within the gang so then crazy steve it just come naturally to him like if his dad made him that weapon he was in a violent um household he ends up running his own dad out the house doesn't he yeah yeah so at one point um when like he's with us he's found wz we're his family we're his brothers it was like he started like terrorizing his dad and his dad became scared of him and he kicked his dad out of the house. I remember his dad knocking on the door trying to get back in and that, but he weren't allowed in, even though I, I really liked Brendan. It good. He was always good to me, but him and him and um, Crazy Steve obviously had their differences and he was out. And then there was a group of, a group of um, kids, probably from the ages of 14 to 16, and we were just li basically living in the house. And then um, things were going downhill and Crazy Steve started like worshiping the devil. I don't really know how you worship the devil, but when you're that age and you're sitting there smoking, like it was hash at the time, smoking hash, you're taking ecstasy, you're drinking and your mind's all over the show. A lot of disturbing things are happening out on the streets and you're vulnerable. And then Crazy Steve's like doing all of that, like this Ouija boards and this self-harm and this um, drawing all these fucking witchcraft signs and all these stars and going like to graves and taking people's gravestones and making shit out of gravestones and a lot of disturbing things would happen he would like convince us that there was demons and that in each other's in gang members in the in the room so when we was like you know two in the morning on a come down from ecstasy and then i remember one day two wz boys one of them just started crying out of nowhere and then he just started attacking another one and then like and crazy steve's there it's not it's not bothering him he's just basically saying yeah that's this demon and he'd have a say like a name for the demon and that's in that boy and it's and there's a spiritual war going on forces going on and then you're just sitting there like what the fuck's going on and then i would go home i'd be like walking home like obviously i had people after me and that anyway so i was always on edge and after smoking loads of hash and stuff going home and like my shadows like follow me ah! like i'm thinking saying it's there and then i'd get i'd get home and um my cat my, my mum had a cat and he would just be sitting there staring at me the eye probably i didn't even put two and two together but the eyes again it's the cat staring at me and and then when i was i said to the crazy he was like what can like spirits and demons and stuff going like animals was like yeah he's like there's probably a, a demon in your cat and it's keeping an eye and then i was convinced by all of this stuff and then he started like talking in tongues and stuff like demonic tongues and he was running around on all fours like going, ah, ah, all this stuff and just like attacking like pit random people on the street and stuff running around on all fours um and then like the place just started deteriorating it went from like writing a couple of tags on the bedroom wall to i mean like sick and blood splatters and like girls self-harming and drinking each other's blood and stuff it was like it fucked up a lot of people's lives that what went on in in that um in that house the house of horrors is called in the book yeah um, and yeah, I saw Crazy Steve when his dad was there. Um, his dad's drinking partner started like having a go at Crazy Steve, and he just come into the room with a machete. I'd got him a machete from one, it's from someone else. I stole it from another WZ member. Like, here's like a, a toy for you. And then he came in with the machete, just like just went for the guy's head. The guy see him last second, just gone out. He chopped through like the man's tendons, like disabled his arm 
see him do some yeah some dark and terrifying terrifying stuff do you manage to get the weapon back off him then i did yeah, yeah i got the weapon back off him i think i got it off him and then i threw it um yeah i threw it near near the white bridge there was a bridge nearby and we threw the weapon but then years or not years months later we got it back but he used to sit in a room like just spinning it around his fingers like this and um what was happening at the time there was a dare called a rise and choke so it was like you still there you smoke a bit of like weed or hash and then like you basically you stand against the wall and a friend a friend yeah would strangle you right a friend would put his hand one one would strangle you like that and the other would press your stomach in so that it's the smoke's held there and then you blow out and you're like literally just like collapsing on the floor it went from a dare till near enough every few pulls we were having on the bong we're just all sitting there just strangling us i once strangled myself so much I just, I, I fucking, I knocked myself out and just woke up on the floor. Yeah, some dark, dark times there. So you're spending more time at Steve's and the gangs now, there's like a merger taking place and then yeah. they have an agreement where you're going to go and meet some of oh, them. Yeah. But you decide to sabotage the merger. Yeah. So what, what was the trick you pulled there? Well, um, WK were doing their own thing in their borough. They had grown. There was some hard people, tough kids and that in it. Um, and there was an idea of WZ joining WK or we joining each other. And it was going to be called WKZ. And I didn't like how the K was coming before the Z. Um, and when I saw Bath and like my cousin Tony and that, going to like join them and they're having this big meet up and stuff. So they had this meet up. I wasn't coming. I, I wouldn't feel safe with them anyway. And then WZ, we, we weren't going to join. Um, so they would meet up and it would just be carnage. Like 30, 40 kids just steaming shops and steaming parties. I mean, like little kids, obviously, because not the, the amount of numbers, but like beating up um, bouncers at the party and a police come and they do, I think it's a code red because there's just kids like literally rioting in this party. WKZ took over this party in Mitchum. Um, but yeah, I never wanted to be a part of it. And Bath had promised WK guys, like a couple of their top guys, that they come to our area, Malden, that they'd be safe and stuff. But when I clocked onto it, he told me and he said, do not tell Crazy Steve because <laughs> he knew what Crazy Steve was like. Um, so, yeah, I just I went round to Crazy Steve's to the house of was in the morning. We had a bottle of vodka drinking it and then he's pissed up, like already charged up. And then I've said to Bath on the phone, I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, I'll just meet up with you lot. And then like he's walking into Maldon with these WK guys. And then all of a sudden, Crazy Steve walks around the corner and just Bath's face just dropped because he knew what was going to happen. But yeah, Crazy Steve just started attacking the guys and that was it. They were fuming. The, the truce or the link up, the combination of crews was, was done there and then. <laughs> so there was another crazy in your boat. You got Crazy Buster and the Bolly Boys. Yeah, that was, um, that was the story I told you about on the Young Offender unit in, okay. in, um, in High Down okay. where he was singing out the window to slagging off people's mums and whatnot. And so how did you first get arrested then for young offenders? Well, um, for we go into the end of the book where um, I get the bigger prison sentence or we go... Um, Let's start with the first sentence. Oh, the first sentence. Yeah. So um, Bath and I think Bath and Nemza, they had been hanging around with some DDS guys the graffiti crew that I told you about from North, they were these guys, the guys that they were with were from North London. And they told me about how they robbed someone. Like the DDS guy showed them what to do. Like they went up, they just caught, it was called jacking back then. So you go up and jack someone, take their stuff. And then Bath and Nems have come back to Malden and they earned probably like 15, 20 quid each or something. And like, yeah, we've done a street robbery. And then I was just like, what street robbery? I was, I think I was, yeah, I was 14 because they waited for me to turn to 15 until I go, then I could be putting Felton for it. And then, um, don't know what it was inside me, but I was like, I want to do a street robbery. So we're out on the trains, Bath and Nems, they weren't really on it, but there was this guy he had loads of gold on. He was around the same age as us. He had a gold bracelet, chain on. And I was just a skinny little kid. Like, 
Um, and I was went up to him, I was like, trying to impress my older friends, like, take your fucking gold off, give me a thing. And then he was just like, fuck off, mate. <laughs> like, and then I was just like, <laughs> And then I was just thinking, like, I didn't know what to do, right? So we we all got onto the train together. And then we used to break into the emergency cabin on the train where there would be saws and first aid boxes and like mini ladders and stuff in case of a, like a big emergency on the train. So I just ripped open the emergency cabin. Bath and Nemza saying to the boy, oh, it's fine, blah, blah, blah. But they had told me about this robbery and I wanted to do one. I just put, found a saw and then I just like ran down the train. I just put the put the saw up to him and was like, give me a fucking chain and that. Give me a fucking chain. He took his chains and stuff off and he like give them to Bath and Nemza. And then we jumped off of the train and I threw the saw down the railway track. Went off. I probably sold like 400 pound chain for something like 20 quid or something. Yeah, one of them. Then we went into um, a pawnbroker's the next day. And we were in the port, like, because Baff looked the oldest, he's trying to pawn the gold. And then we're just trying to not look bait with our hoods up and our baseball caps to the sides and that. And then um, the boy that we robbed walks in with someone that knows me from school. That was it, man. When I'm, I was like, that's it. Like, I think British Transport Police raided the house for a couple of days later and then I just like went on a run, jumped out the window and I, and I was gone. But yeah, I went to Felton for that. I, got, I only got four months. They waited till I was 15. I got four months in um, Kingston Crown Court. And looking back now, four months is a joke. You're doing two months, you're doing eight weeks. But to a kid that's never been away from his family, like, and I thought I was this big, hard kid around my community. And I got the shock of my life and I walked into Felton and it was just like, kids from like had them issues with my race and stuff i never knew any asian people i walk in and they're just like ghetto um tamil boys sri lankan tamil boys ghetto bengali boys from east london there's travelers there's african somalians english like and it was just like whoa like some big culture shock and i just got bullied and like terrorized from the start can you take us through your first day the first day, like, I'm sitting there, like, I, I, I'm a kid here, but I look back looking like a right div, right? I'm I'm there in, like, a shirt and tie and and, and um, some nice trousers that my mum's got me for my court day, and I get taken to this prison van. I don't even know what a prison van is, right? And then there's, like, some ghetto kids in there, like, in their tracksuits and stuff, and they're banging away. Like, just shout to me, and I am just shitting myself. Take me to Feltham, go for this big, door and then i think the van turned around on this like circle thing and then you go through and then straight away you, you that never leaves you the first sound of prison like screaming shouting echoing and then like the buzzing of the walkie talkies like the screws and then you're going through and then they're just like giving you've got to get your clothes and they're just doing it for a laugh like this big guy giving gonna give me my clothes i'm like probably a size 26 waist or something or 28 waist he gives me like a 36 or something so straight away i'm having to use a shoelace to like tie it together they give you odd shoes like yeah and it was just it was just it was confusing but i had put myself in that situation do you know what i mean but it was gonna toughen me up and harden me up but felt and back then was it was horrible i i would was one of the smallest in there and i happened to work on the servery serving up the food with one of the biggest guys in there so it was like little and large and it was it was when officers like screws they would still use like racist slurs and stuff so i was called little ladle and big and i was with big ladle so that was right like slang for little spoon and big spoon, little mm. coon, big coon. Like mm. they could openly use that language in that back then. And this was the time when um, I wasn't in film at the time. I literally just got out. And that's when Robert Stewart, um, who was like a known racist, um, violent guy, battered um, Zahid Mubarak to death in his cell. Um, and it was, you know, there was things, I don't actually know what exactly happened, but there was always stuff in the press and rumors and inquiries and inquests that the prison officers there would put certain prisoners in cells together for a laugh to see if it would kick off and stuff. And they'll call it gladiator wars. And yeah, that's basically how harsh Felton was that that Robert Stewart just battered Zahi to death in his sleep. Bat he was getting out the next day as well. I batted him to oh, death so with like sense. a table leg or something. Yeah, it was it was a scary place. And I I went came out of there more 
definitely more damage than it was just a, it was just the start start of the cycle it was weird like one day i must have got it was probably more than 16 letters but i got about around 16 letters from kids around my local borough school kids and stuff that heard 7067s is in prison and it was like fan mail and to a kid that never felt like wanted or loved or accepted and problems with my race and stuff it was like oh my god i'm getting like people was like worshiping that a kid had gone to fucking prison like but to me it was like well it's good so i i come out of prison and even though i got bullied in there I didn't tell anybody that. Do you know what I mean? I come out and then those girls all wanted to be with me and I was like proper infamous and that around the local schools and stuff. And then just like that, you are just sucked straight back into that cycle and it just fucking, you can't get out of it. So you talked about going in, just go to back, going yeah. back a bit. You're at reception. They give you these clothes that yeah. are too big for you. And then is that all that happens in reception or did more stuff happen? No, that's about... That's about it in reception. And then where did they send you next? Is it like a dorm or a cell? You got cellmates? They, yeah, they they put me in a cell um, with this guy. I I didn't even know where I was. Like, I literally didn't know where I was. I didn't know what Felton was. I was just put into this cell with this older guy. He was nice to me. He gave me some tobacco and stuff and was trying to, like, break down what it's like and that. And then the next day, I was moved on to, yeah, onto a unit. So you was in, like, a two-man cell with this yeah. guy. And how, what does a unit look like? A Feltham unit was is it's not like a like a adult prison. Um, sort of the same layout as the young offender unit in Wood Hill, but it was small. I think there was probably about 30 cells. And there was all to one side, there was like three landings. So you might have 10 cells, another 10 a landing. There might have actually been two landings, I can't remember. But um, and then you would have like the office below and a little area where you could play pool and stuff. Yeah. And then you said you get to this place now, you're shitting it. And have you got a new cellmate in this place? No, it was in single cells. Oh, single cells, sorry. Yeah, yeah. All right. I mean, how did it come about that you started to get bullied in there? Um, just because cause I, was, cause I was little, like you would have the, the slang for it or the names, it was little man. You'd have little man, big man, tall man, skinny man. Mm. It was like, yes, yeah, a little man. Like everyone just wanted a piece of me, wanted to take my stuff, wanted to like give me the sly dig and punch and that here and there. And, and I just who, who was just, the first person to come and try and take your stuff? A guy called who was just called Paddy, but there was loads of Paddies in there. Um, he was just like, so just, just an horrible, horrible bully. Just come in, took my stuff. You would. Because I was, I think, 15 and you couldn't buy tobacco, but I think I think you could buy tobacco at 16 or somehow. We had tobacco over there. I'd get my tobacco somehow through an older kid and then come in my cell, start hitting me to take my tobacco and I'm just start scared stiff. Couldn't do nothing about it. Couldn't do nothing about it. Mm. So did you f make alliances with people in there that enabled you to reduce any of that? No, not really, because it, it was only eight weeks. It literally just, it just, yeah, it just disappeared, flew, yeah. and then and then and then I was back out on the street. And the guards, did they come in and beat you up or anything? No, no. Okay. Yeah. So you do your eight weeks in there. This is now you've got this like hero status on the streets. Yeah. So now that's causing you to slip back into bigger crimes, is it? Um, it was the start of like the school didn't want me back there. Um. Why do I even I didn't even do anything wrong at school, but why do they want a kid that had been into Feltham? So I was on the streets and I didn't want to be in school anyway. And then when you say on the streets, are you yeah. living on the streets now? No, uh, no, we, well, got your parents. We, we literally we we would literally not go home. It was just it was where's the next cotch? Cotch was where you're just gonna chill out, hang out, sleep and stuff. So but where there was the graffiti side of it, we would we would sleep in um train depots, tube depots you wouldn't sleep in because of the cleaners at night but would sleep in train depots um bus depots uh and the railway for me the railway being on the railway tracks at night the trains are finished you're, you're safe yeah so you've got people after you you're in you're in central like central london you're in clapham you're in like busy tough areas and you're a little you're a little boy yeah there's like pedophiles and nutters all sorts of people out in the street that can get you right um so you would climb out climb onto the railway which felt completely comfortable there and that's where you were safe it was literally just you and the foxes you see the odd fox run past or appear and you'd be 
yeah, just walking down a railway tracks and that, that's your safety. If you're going to go from one area, you know, it's one area to another area and you can work out that train line to, will cut me off being on the streets where it's dangerous. So you're, you're basically there. Yeah. So how are you making money now? Um, we started stealing like petty stuff, stealing phones, stopped the street robberies. Well, saying that I was convicted before uh, later on for robberies, but we stopped the like going out jacking people. Um, that was you was laughed at that crime in prison. Um, you know, robbing like you go up to a random person, you don't even know if they've got money on them. You try to take the money and you, you're gonna get nicked and go to prison, right? So that went out the window, and then we started going into um, like estate agents, someone would go and ask for like, um, like uh, what properties were, were to let to get a bit of paperwork on it. Who's going to believe some like snotty little kid in a hoodie and that, but someone would do that, distract them and then we'd nick the phone or the laptop and we would literally travel around the London underground doing that. Um, and then we'd come back to the area, we'd have like a kebab shop or an off license where the guy would buy the phones and stuff cheaper. One day, so we, oh, actually, we built up this thing like called like baiting it up. Um, it was it's called distraction theft or distraction burglary, but we just called it baiting up. So I'd say to my mate, bait it up. Like I've seen something in the shop, bait up. He's got to go and distract that person. I come in, steal it, or the other way around. One day, someone, some uh, a shopkeeper was off the counter. One a friend went round and just got this little box no one even noticed We've gone down the road open up the box there's top up cards in there uh for pay as you go top up cards when they were like scratch cards so there was like this old school like bt cell net and one to one um and they would uh, so say you could buy a 10 pound top up card they would come in like say packs of 200 so it'd be a little plastic wrap around it and there'd be like 200 pounds worth of 10 pound top up cards in there and um Ran around the corner, opened it up, we're like, fuck, what's... take it to off license. Guy's been buying phones. He's like, what? Give you half the money. So, say there was like £400 worth there, that's £200 in your pocket. And then it just developed into that's that's our way of making money. Um, we became experts here. And the, the most money, the most top up cards are in tough areas like Hackney, Peckham, like places in North London, Harles, and where there's big off licenses with a lot of people coming in so they got a lot more top of cars but the shops also run by like you know like turkish guys kurdish guys like shopkeepers that are not gonna fucking have it you're not in a little shop in the country um and yeah like the confrontations the fights you're getting locked into the shop things are getting smashed you're running out the back of their house trying to get like back of the shop and it turns the house you're trying to get out of the shop um but yeah that just that just basically became it so the top up cards you you would walk say say um one london underground stop to the next so it might take 15 20 minutes and you would look through each shop window there'd probably be advertisements on the window but little gaps and you'd look behind the counter and you'd see say a petty cash box or a cigar box or an ice cream box a little tub and it would have top of glass. sometimes it would even have cash in so that was it man we we was well, they I, th I do think that they stopped top up cards because of wz and the amount of thefts of of them, yeah. How many times did you get locked in? Oh, loads of times. Got locked so if you in. get locked in, like, can you give us an example of how you get out? Um, if you get locked in, you, you, your mate's trying to get you out, but obviously he wants to get away as well. It's yeah. like the, what are the ones that got... Windows would get smashed, bottles would get thrown, it, it would just get thingy. Like, give you an example of going out brew raising. Brew, brew is obviously alcohol slang. Brew raising is ra raising is stealing. So, graffiti writers would have big bulky jackets even in the summer, and we'd push the spray can up our sleeve. So you could push a few spray cans, but spray can obviously the same shape as a can of beer. So we'd go up. Oh, let's go brew raising. It's like a group of adults going on a pub crawl, right? So um, we start off. We went up. We me and a, a few guys. We went up to Cheam. Um, and we'd always have a stereo with us, listen to our music when we're pissed up and stuff. Um, and obviously you've got to keep on stealing batteries. The batteries are huge, yeah, because they run out like day and they've run out. Um, so go into the shop, start stealing alcohol. One of my mates gets locked in. Um, I think, I 
cousin Tony picks up the lottery sign, you know, like the swinging sign outside the shop. It's like smashing in the window to get him out. They open the door to get my cousin Tony. He runs, they get the lottery sign, I'm outside, my mate gets free and he just smashes me with the lottery sign. I'm on the floor, he's like, hit me lottery sign. My cousin Tony comes over with the bloody stereo, smashes it over the guy's head, batteries going falling out and then they're throwing batteries at the guy to get him off. Anyway, we're so drunk, we don't run, we just start walking off to the next shop about 15 minutes down the road. Um... This is me having wars with like bloody Asian shopkeepers and that, probably all to do with that stuff in my early childhood, all like, and they're just men trying to earn a living and we're just little shit scumbags coming in just trying to take what they've they what they've what paid for and, and earned. Anyway, we go on, walk into this other shop, unaware that obviously the police are probably dealing with down 15 minutes down the road, go into the shop, start nicking some more alcohol um, and... I'm like to my cousin Tony, let's bogart some cig cigarettes. Bogart, that was slang term for grabbing sang and just running. So I'm like, can I get full cigarettes, please, mate? He puts it down. My cousin Tony grabs them and just runs out of the shop. Like I'm acting like I don't know him. And then my mate's a bit too slow. He's still at the fridge um, stealing alcohol. And he goes to walk out and a man can't get, he don't think I'm with Tony. He can't get Tony, but he grabs my other mate um because of tony's stolen the cigarettes my mate just picks up a bloody bottle of red wine and just smashes it over his head and then obviously there's blood you don't know what's blood and what's red wine if he gets away we just start fucking running now cut down a few back roads and then we're like right we're probably in a different town now and then it's like right let's go um walk into tesco's yeah we just must be absolutely out of it not realizing the trail of destruction behind us, walk into Tesco, just start like playing football with a melon or something like that, right? We don't think anything of it. And we're just like pissed out. We've left Tesco's now. We're walking over towards the Tesco's petrol garage. And I was just like hanging around like this, just look around. And then the security guard from Tesco's, we don't even know, he's followed us from across, across the car park and he's got my friend, um, Lend, he's got him in a headlock, and like Lend's just like laying on the floor like this, like and on, on the middle of the garage uh, four call, and then the security guards like thinking, oh fuck, like these three guys are coming over to me now, and because we used to like always terrorize on the trains, cause havoc like the graffiti lifestyle and get fire extinguishers, spray them out the window and stuff. My mate sees a fire extinguisher, thinks it's gonna be water, like a water spray, goes over to the security guard in his face presses it but it's like a powder yeah so like the powder just like engulfs the petrol garage and just creates like a white um mist like smoke like thing and then my mates like come loose and he's running then we like start running around run down his back roads get down to this bus garage where we're going to sleep for the night and then just for everywhere, mate, police were there. Like two different boroughs, police were, were just there and that was it. Yeah. So is that your next major rest then? You're going to do some time yeah, for this no, one? We, we got, what we've done, we decided that we all sit down. This is this is where I, I, was, I was a bit more clever than some of my friends. We sit down, we, get, we get, all get arrested, no comments. Then we sit down and we, we're all on bail. And then we say, right, let's split the crimes up, yeah? Let's split them up. You, you, you stole the cigarettes. You done the bottle. You threw the batteries. You stole the alcohol, and then and that's what we done. We split up the crimes. We went back. Said he's he's done this. Everyone admitted for what they done. So it weren't like all of us getting done. Like G, he's getting done for GBH theft. You know. So yeah, we split up, and I didn't. Yeah, I didn't even get a big time for it, mate. Mine was just stealing alcohol. So you go uh, through that. You've, yeah. not, you've not learned your lesson then. I'm saying no. it, it's going to escalate to something yeah, bigger. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, talk about after Joe, after Bath died. Yeah. Um, at the time, he had escalated probably two, three years had passed since being in Feltham. Bath, Joe had been found dead in our manor, and I was in a confused state like what has happened to wz like i was a little kid created this thing just been sucked into this lifestyle for three years i've became this character 
but now my friend's dead. Like, it's too much for me. One WZ boy has just got life sentence for stabbing um, a girlfriend's mum. Another WZ boy, a WZ boy that was there um, during the that long brew raising mission where the guy got bottle smashed. He just he had just stabbed someone in a fight and killed him, and he just got life sentence. And then it was just like, what is going on? Like I'm and then in my mind it was like I've got all these wars with these different gangs, Croydon, Streatham and stuff. But now I felt like I was on my own. Even I had a gang now, I felt I was on my own because I didn't have Joe Bath, who was like an older brother to me, who started it all off with me. So have you ditched Crazy Steve at this point? I don't I think Crazy Steve might have been on the run or something. He had disappeared or he might have been in prison himself. Um so I'm carrying a meat cleaver. Like in my mind, it's like, right, you stab I've stabbed and stuff, but I've got kids from Croydon, there could be 10 of them coming for me. If I've got this meat cleaver on my waistbound, pull that out, like the majority of them are going to run. So that was what I worked out in my mind. So I've got this meat cleaver on me, having loads of confrontations, um, loads of fights. More, in Malden, in our town, we would climb up on the roofs. So we're on the tops of like shops like Greg's, on tops of the banks and stuff, and we can look down into the street. We'd be um, we'd be in the back alley, and there's someone on the phone, and they say, like, Creighton boys, there. I've just seen them. They're looking for you, yeah? We're around the backs of the shops. We're, up, we're on the roof now, yeah? We're looking down, looking over, and there's these guys. I know that they're tooled up, and they're going to come for us so that was my state i felt like i was pushed in i was trapped in and i started sleeping where joe had been found dead and i um probably set you know sleeping there on and off um and i was just in a mad state and i drinking loads and it's just like right i'm just gonna rob something like, i just wanted it to end i wanted to be killed or just to kill and just just finish Finish WZ, finish everything. So um, I was with this guy. He weren't really a uh, weren't really a friend. He was sort of like a tag along guy, like a um, not really a big member in WZ. And I was like, right, let's go. On a I think he was just following me, like like um, probably impressed by me at the time. Like, let's go on a tube, just like rob someone. I'd been done for robbing on the train. Very well known to the police and the British Transport Police, um, the Met Police and the British Transport Police. So I get onto the tube. Um, and I just know that this is it now. Fucking, I'm on CCTV. I'm gonna get nicked. Gonna go away for a long time. But I need a breather. There's a guy. He's Malden's the last stop. He's just asleep. The train. We get on. He's the train starts moving north again. Gets towards South Wimbledon. I go up to him and try to wake him up with the meat cleaver. I don't even know what I'm doing. So I'm not doing it controlled. I'm like wake up. Like what, what, give me a wallet. Give me a wallet. He wakes up. He might have been a bit pissed up not knowing what's going on and he just sees a meat cleaver looks at me and he just jumps up and then the blade cut catches him on a chin cuts him down a chin and it's only two minutes to each stop he runs off at south wimbledon runs off screaming and then another guy gets on at the other carriage um a sri lankan guy it was gets on we don't even think of um like getting off or what are we doing rub the blood off on the seat and um walk down the carriage and then he just sees me with the meat cleaver. And then he, uh, my friend goes up to him, starts trying to search him. And he sees the meat cleaver and he gets up, he grabs my um, friend and like drags him down into the corner of the carriage. And then he's trying to get him. And then I'm like, oh, fuck. Like, um, no. So I go over trying to help him, like get the guy to meat cleaver. And he spins around, he gets me and he's got my hands like that. And I'm probably about seven stone. It's a big guy. And I'm trying to wrestle with him. And then he just like threw, threw me onto the floor. So we we're on the floor together and a train just like buzzing through the, through the tunnel, winging towards Collier's Wood. Um, and then I just think, fuck, this is it, mate. Fucking just take, take the fucking meat cleaver. Just, just do me with it. Just do me. Like, I've had enough, right? He gets the meat cleaver off of, well, he's, yeah, the meat cleaver goes on to, he gets the meat cleaver. My mate's trying to get him off me. And then he gets my mate in the corner now with the, and he's trying to go for my mate with a meat cleaver. I get the fire extinguisher. 
run down. I start smashing him in the back and head with the meat uh, with the fire extinguisher. My mate gets free. My mate runs off through the door. He's fucking gone. I turn around and the guy's there and he's just like, bam, bam, bam. Just chops me like, chops me down the side of the the face there. Chops straight through my bone. I look down. I could just see the white bone just like hanging out. Pins holding it together. Chopped me in the elbow and then caught my leg a little bit. And I'm like, ah, please, man. <laughs> so I stop. But I was so disturbed. I ran out of station, up, going up the escalators and met up with my mate. And then I said to someone, I was like, I said to some random woman, I was like, so I've got something on my face. She was like, you need to go to hospital. It was just opened up like this. Mm. I'm walking down all these back rows, heading up towards Tootin, and I bumped into some like gang that I knew. And they were like, fuck sevens, man. What's happened to your face? Oh, bro, look, man. Like, I was actually so disturbed at the time that it was like, yes, look at these wounds. They look good. Anyway, went to the hospital, nicked, didn't see the street again for about four, about three to four years, man, three and a half years or something. So and what, what were you charged with at this point? You only just pulled the door up and let's fresh air in. Thanks. I um I was charged with two two robberies. I, yeah, two robberies. It weren't street robberies, it was on the tube, but I got four and a half years each one. But back then you had to serve three years um, and I got some extra time for you could get extra time and that back then, but there was some, it all came out that prisons. So how old are you now when you get yeah. in charge with these street robberies? I was, um, I was 17. 17. So does that mean you're still going to be young offender yeah. classification? Yeah. Back to Feltham. Yeah. Um, are you a bit more established in Feltham? Yeah. Or are you still getting yeah. Bullied? No, no, I'm not getting bullied anymore. Um, but it's like new paranoia, like, cause of the, beef that i've been having on the outside people the different games. yeah yeah people writing to me saying mate you're lucky you've gone away because people's uncles brothers like more hard and people they're, cu they're coming for you so so I, that was i'm sitting on a bed and that was it i could like breathe for a bit and then obviously all the mental health stuff starts coming in um but yeah i saw the the bully paddy um the one that was like bullying me like a couple of years before i wish i i wish i could turn around and say yeah like done this done that but looked over at him and he'd give me the double look he knew it was me and then i was just watching him watching him he looked the other way and then i was just satisfied it wasn't the story of like you know getting all out revenge but i just knew myself that i had developed like i weren't going to take any shit so what happens next when you get out of that time young offenders that was the that was when i got the four and a half years and yeah. i went through all of that dark stuff i talked about at the beginning the okay. mental health side yeah and all that side with the guy that was in for um, murder and then they said I could go broad more. And, so and, how old are you now when you see the guy who's in for murder? I was probably about 18, 19. Okay. And then um, I, I somehow get through that prison sentence and then I'm released. Like, they didn't give me, um, you know, town visits and stuff because I'm so unstable, right? So I've yeah. gone from being in like... Alsbury, all of them years with all of them killers. I mean, there were some dark, dark people in there. Um, what's that guy's name? Um, Christopher Honeyset. This is just a few people that are in there. Christopher Honeyset was in there. He had um, killed the local vicar, which he had, I think it was a choir boy, he killed a local vicar, um, like chopped him up, left parts of him around um eastbourne like near the ledger center and stuff he was in there my friend tracy he had killed um a homeless guy in a park no in a cemetery in east london in bethnal green it was just full of like murderers like cook from newcastle he had snatched an old lady's bag and she uh, fell down had a blood clot and bloody like died a couple of like weeks later um who else was in there? And well, I first met, a, like, I become friendly with a Sri Lankan guy, um, Nathan. He had, he was, he was involved in like a Tamil killing. There was a there, back then, like Operation Trident for black on black gun crime in the capital. There was uh, the Tamil task force because there was a lot of Tamil killings going on at the time, and he had um, killed another Tamil, like a, a Tamil guy, like stabbed him to death in a park in um north london and burnt his corpse it was like fucking i go from that and all that paranoia and all that shit to being pushed out onto the street 
didn't get on with my probation. I was finding it extremely difficult. I have to go and live back at my mum's house. She's in a new house. She's like, this is your bedroom. <laughs> I'm like up in this room, I'm like straight away, I'm like, what the fuck? Like a wooden flimsy door, like anyone can come in here and get me. Um, I walk downstairs to go to the toilet, I'm on edge, I'm like building up, like, I need to go to the toilet, I walk downstairs, and then my mum's neighbour's there, George, right? And then she's like, oh, this is George. I'm thinking, fuck, who's this guy? Like, is, um, is he one of this, is he fucking from like A block or something? Like, is he, he's going to do me, right? Getting knives collecting knives from the cutlery drawer. And in my mind, my mum was a prison officer. Um, George was a was a was um, like a, an inmate, like a prisoner, someone that's up to no good, even though he wasn't up to no good. It's going to do like, cause me harm. And then I just, I was locking myself in. I couldn't come out. So I was collecting bottles and I was like pissing in the bottles and leaving them like stacked up, hidden in the bedroom. My mum's calling me a dirty bastard and that for that. And, but how can you explain how fucked up you, fucked up you are? Yeah. So do you start to readjust or does it escalate again? No, it escalates again. Um, my mum's got a new boyfriend. I didn't like him. I threatened to stab him and I threatened to stab my mum. And she was just, she was shitting herself. Like when I look back how fucked up I was. I didn't realize, I was so agitated. I had that murderer in my head 24 seven. I could not relax. So like if I walked down a road and someone looked at me the wrong way, it was like, fucking it's gonna go off. Like, you, you're all right, mate. And then the guy's like, what do you mean? You're, you're all right, mate. And then it's like that. And it was just that guy, that killer's eyes walking around the corner, just staring at me. Mm. It was that in my head constantly. And no one knew why my mood was like that. So I'd threatened to kill my mum's boyfriend and threatened to kill her. I just went mental. Like the world in my mind, the world owed me for going through that shit in prison when it was all my all my doing. I put myself there. Um, so then I just started living on the started sleeping in a local bus garage again, you know, years later after coming out. And um my probation officer got me a place at this hostel and it was all like ex-offenders or people that had just come out so i walked into the hostel and it was like nah i ain't staying here it was um you know different in my mind different different um prisoners so um yeah i was basically staying on the street and did you get arrested again um i got arrested because i was meant to sign sign on for the hostel to a place to live, but I couldn't explain that. It reminded me too much of pris a prison environment. So instead of signing the paperwork to get a permanent place there, I started staying on the street and I went and stole a BB gun, which looked like a real gun from a from a market stall. And I was walking around with it on my waistbound. Police truck come to pull me up and I ran through the uh, BB gun over some scaffolding, got arrested and I went to, I was got put in Wandsworth prison for for a few weeks and even though i was on license yeah i that somehow they didn't put two and two together that i was on license so i didn't get recalled uh, this is probably months later after i got out so i was out again and then i was just basically trying to be not trying to be because i was a violent person but i saw no hope for me being in a normal nine to five world with normal people um so i fitted in with obviously the lunatics the maniacs the robbers and everybody so i just went into that lifestyle of just i wasn't a gang member anymore i wanted to be like a gangster or a, i was more just a violent fucked up young man um and then the last violent incident i got arrested for um i was in a club there was quite a lot of stuff going on at this club because it played r b and rap so it would attract a lot of right like rival gangs and stuff from around south london i think um just absolute drink and me don't mix i haven't drank for years now um but that evil person comes out and i'm in the club and i'm thinking yeah this is my manner thinking i'm just just a young sh stupid mindset come out of the club some guys are giving it i'm thinking like i ain't scared of these guys i've been in gangs prison whatever so com confrontation starts and i just run towards them hit one and then 14 of them 
because it was 14 because it was on CCTV, right? So 14 of them start steaming me, but 14 people can't get one person. There's no way, you know, they've got to take it. It's all like people moving back and forth. So I'm there, my hands over the head and I'm just getting hit. And when you get hit in the head, it's like a flash. Like the way I could describe it is like, you know, you, an old TV which just locks off and just goes like fuzzy, fuzzy black, white and grey dots. So you're getting hit and you're seeing these flashes and then there was this voice in my head saying, why is it going on so long? Why is it going? And then it was just like, it like the last attack has come off of me and I'd always trained myself being out on the streets. When a gang comes and you haven't got a weapon, you find a bin. You know, nine times out of ten, you just throw that bin over and a glass bottle will fall out of the bin. You get that bottle, you've got your weapon to defend yourself, right? So about five seconds after the last attack had come off me, I stumble this way and I grab a bin, throw it on the floor. And then 13 seconds after the last attack I got off, I got a bottle and in one move and I pick it up and just hit off the side of the wall. So I got... And then I just walk up to the crowd. It wasn't the gang. It was a crowd of innocent people just watching the fight. And one of them was a DJ from the club, stabbed the DJ in the neck, stabbed oh. another guy in the head. And then that was it. Uh, I'd done it in such a movement, the police that were already there that didn't even do anything when I'm getting attacked, um, thought it was a punch because I'd done the bottle and bang like that, bang, bang. Um, so then I find myself in a fucking mental situation where I'm in... Sutton Police Station and I'm being arrested for two GBA Section 18s. But I'm concussed at this stage. I don't know what's going on. I don't even know what I've done. I'm pissed up and I'm concussed. Um, and I get interviewed the next day. They they bail me for two Section 18s. So section 18s. I walk out and my car's gone. Like somebody nicked my car. I think that was all I had was I had a smart car, I had a key, smart car key in my pocket and I just... All I had was a weapon before the bottle was just to dig someone in the eye or the face fight, trying to fight back. So I dropped the key and then some, so I've come out battered in a white paper suit. The police took all my stuff and my car's gone as well. I was like at rock bottom, right? Mm. I, I went home and I was doing really weird stuff like leaving the front door open or like fucking having a breakdown. Like, oh, there's nothing in my fucking fridge and I couldn't walk to the shop. And then I was like, what is fucking wrong with me? Like what, like, what is going on? Like, I'm used to being beaten up, man. I'm used to being rushed, used to being stabbed. Like, what is going on? And then, and then I started having this fucking like pure panic attack coming over me. And it was like, like the first time in my life, it was like, you're used to being stabbed. You're used to be, that, that's not fucking normal. That, that's not normal. And for the first time in my life, I, I was like, whoa, like this is not normal. Violence, you're not being beaten up and it's not normal. So then that was it. And I, I went to therapy and then like, I, was, I saw the therapist, Every, everyone was a threat to me. Like I saw the therapist as a threat. And then we just like she started asking me about my early childhood, and I said, "Oh yeah, just like strangled a um, child mine as like it was nothing." She was like, "That's child abuse." Like, we started like delving deep into my past, and and then it just yeah, just start everything just started dawning on me and making sense. And then at the time, I got charged with the two section 18s, and it was like, "Fuck, I'm going to go back to jail now. I'm going to have more episodes of this killer and these people. Where they're going to come after me to post traumatic stress." That's what the therapist said. I got post-traumatic stress from loads of incidents in my life. Um, and I thought, that's it. But then I started building, becoming stronger, questioning my life, still fucking miles off being like normal. I'd never, I'd never be normal because of the damage and stuff done. Um, but by the time I went to Croydon Crown Court and pleaded guilty, I'd done a plea bargain, get it down to two GBHs on the basis that the judge will watch me being attacked before he sentenced me. And it, remember, it was only 13 seconds after when obviously two innocent people, which was um, obviously bad and I wish never happened, got hurt. It was only 13 seconds after and I was confused and I was concussed. Uh, it wasn't like two minutes, five minutes after I went down the road and was like, right, I'm going to go back, do these guys. Um, and then I just got the harshest, harshest prison sent, um, community sentence. So I got anger replacement therapy, uh, community service, had to pay money to the victims. Um, 
some other stuff uh, i can't even i can't really remember but um yeah i didn't go to prison and it was because i seeked therapy before i was even charged not knowing this as well before i was even charged therapist wrote this really good letter on my development and stuff you know a year had probably passed before sentencing and then the the barrister was like look he seeked therapy before he's even been charged with a crime and everything was put in and then that was it I, I got out, but I weren't happy. Like I was, I weren't happy. I weren't going away. It was just, I was just drained. But then I just sat there. That's when I started writing my book. So, how old were you then, and why did you start writing the book? Um, I was about probably about twenty three. How, how old are you now? I'm thirty four now. Okay, so ten years ago, what yeah. triggered the book? Um, well, baths dad jo joe's dad i met him when i was locked up next to richard markham um in hmp high down on the healthcare unit met him for the first time um and he was a tough prisoner he had done like 30 years in prison and he told me he was writing a book he was going to be published with penguin and then he just inspired me i thought well, me i've i've lived a life and i'm only like fucking 23 24 i'm gonna write a book so I start, yeah, I didn't realize because I didn't really go to school and stuff. So Razor, that was Baff's dad who wrote a book. Um, he was in Whitemore at the time. Pretty, He went back from High Down to Whitemore. Started writing him letters saying like, look, I'm going to write a book. And stuff. He said, look, send me three chapters of it. I sent him three chapters of the book. And he, he said, this is brilliant. Um, I didn't have any like... I didn't have like have any qualifications, anything English. Didn't do, didn't go to school. Um, but somehow I got a raw talent for writing. So, yeah, it's like, extremely gripping. Noel Razor was on James English podcast. We got him on this podcast, filming with him again today. Um, we had a guard on the podcast, and he was talking about people setting fire to themselves and self harming oh, and all this yeah, stuff. Yeah, I can tell you some stories about self harming, man. I saw I was going to ask yeah, you. Yeah, like um, because that's what I always try. I've wrote little bits and pieces. Like I break it down a little bit in uh, in my book about healthcare units. So a prison healthcare unit is it's meant to be for physically ill prisoners, right? So for prisoners comes in injured, whatever. There was. Say there was 30 cells there, there was only two prisoners that were physically ill. Like, um, you know, someone that had a police chase and he's on remand, he's got a broken leg or so, there's a disabled prisoner. But it was usually prisoners are waiting to be sectioned under the Mental Health Act. So they were mentally unstable prisoners. Um, and the self-harm I saw, man, it was like dark... I mean, um, Aussie, Turkish heroin guy, dealer from North London, he had um, swallowed batteries. So, like, he had to be rushed off. They cut his belly open so the mercury don't poison him. Um, Tracy, who actually committed suicide in Belmarsh, um, he would knock on the... On, this is when I was in Owlsby. He'd knock on this cell door, calling me, Rollins, Rollins, Rollins. And I'll go to the door and he's got wounds that have been opened time and time and again. And he's cut a, a line in his wrist and he's got his fingers in and he's got his ligaments and he's going, Rollins, Rollins. And he's pulling his ligaments and he's like waving at me like this with his pulling his ligaments like that. Um, Ward, who was on the 24 hour watch cell another time in High Down, um, Irish, he was an Irish traveler. He had sliced his neck, yeah, just sliced his throat like from there to there. And they didn't even stitch up. They had stapled it somehow back together. Um, there was a guy who was in for murder. He had just, just psychopath, battered someone to death, random person battered them to death with a brick. He had from his ankles up to his neck, like not on his hands and not on his face, up, up to his neck. He just had the neatest little razor slices. So he would just do like one, two, three, one, two, like his whole body was just a thousand razor slices um yeah it was there was people they would on these healthcare units they would cut a little hole in her arm get a uh, an aerial from a radio and push the aerial up into their arm it was yeah just the self-harm and stuff is just like 
just so disturbing, so dark. It's a it's a dark place. A lot of people don't see that stuff in prison. They know it goes on, but they didn't live that sort of prison life, like held on healthcare units and stuff. But it's like it's, I suspect it's like being held in a psychiatric unit. Maybe even worse because. Those people are waiting to be uh, sectioned and they're not put into categories. Everyone just thrown together. So I understand this destructive behavior in your life trajectory, the horrendous things that happened early on. How did it make you feel when you first self-harmed? What was that feeling it gave you? Um, I was, it, I don't know, like the pain felt good because I think I hated myself. So the pain would have felt good. Um, just the tearing that with a razor, it felt fucking horrible. You feel that fucking skin like, oh, that was horrible, painful. But like the more like digging and carving with a plastic knife and I felt good. It was take, it was basically taking the pain out of my mind, the mental torture out of my mind. And I was feeling it in a physical form instead of a mental form. So it really put you in the present moment by doing that. That pain yeah. focuses you. I remember I had the tooth cracked and all night long. I'm, I can't sleep. Just the pain. That's all I'm focused on. Yeah. It was it was horrible. Yeah. But yeah. I was completely present. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was like a it was like a release. Um a release of tension, build up, like it would just release it and you'd you would feel calm afterwards. The pain so he's still there, but you'd feel calm. But yeah, it's um so looking at my arm and like I've covered my scars with tattoos, but like I'm really conscious of them. Like say I'm on holiday or like even if I've got a like a t-shirt on, like in the in the light, in the sun, it would like shut you can see that there's something there. And I'm people probably not noticing them, but I'm conscious of there and it just reminds me like you're a, you're a freak, you're a nutter, you're your horrible past, you know what I mean? I've got quite a few. I've yeah. had a girlfriend who used to drink my blood. She, she slashed my arm and put yeah. the blood in a glass of wine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like the house of horrors, man. <laughs> <laughs> she said, I'm going to take your power through this. Oh. And that was the peak of everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she did. Oh. So um, you said you hated yourself. Yeah. What is your opinion of yourself now? Like, I'll just be brutally honest, right? I've got a beautiful wife. I've got two beautiful daughters. Um, they're stunning. They're... They, I'm their rock, but I have like bad post-traumatic stress still, still have it to this day. Like I think I'm like, oh, cured and I'm fine and that, but my moods still go up and down. Um, it used to be, say that I had like a little, say I had a little confrontation. Obviously I don't put myself in that environment now, but years ago, if I put a com had a confrontation with somebody, that person was just got on with their day they're not thinking but i would think about that for two three days like that person and i'm gonna fucking kill him and whatnot but so i i don't obviously have that now but i have little things just play on my mind but i find ways to try and cope by obviously going back to my graffiti doing my art obviously in therapy they use art therapy so heavily into my graffiti and doing my art canvases and that's when i do graffiti i'm i think i'm always agitated but um it takes me away from it for say two, three, four hours. I'm just sort of in, in a zone or yeah, just being around my kids, trying to give a hundred, hundred percent, thousand percent with my kids being a good dad, reading with them, like just being like over the top, good dad to them. So they never go down a path that I went down and love, love is the most important thing to give them. Where do you, can you do your graffiti at now? Um, Loads of walls in London, all over, all over England. Loads of um, tolerated places. Uh, you got you got semi-tolerated places. Say like an old derelict building that someone owns, and they don't give a damn that people are going in there doing graffiti and whatnot. Or, like where the skaters are on South Bank, is that? Somewhere yeah, you yeah, can so just that's legal. But like in in the terms of graffiti, it's not really the best. You won't, you don't, we well, don't get any props or respect for doing graffiti in legal places. It was. So graffiti started off in say the late 60s in like the ghettos in New York, like Bronx, Brooklyn. And it started off with people writing their name and their street number. It's like Mike 171 and whatnot. Then it developed into nicknames, tags, and then painting the subways. And then even back in the 70s, they, they, them kids were getting on the subways and robbing like robbing each other robbing paint and then that lifestyle come to london and that's that's what you got respect for within that community 
painting London Underground, painting trains, painting stations. Um, so you didn't really get respect. You don't get respect, but I'm 34. I don't want respect. It's it's um it's for my mind, man. It's for my mental health. Why I'm to WZ and what's your graffiti name these days? Uh, my graffiti name's still the same, 706. Um and WZ just like I still write WZ next to my thing, but it's more of like I'm leaving the story. Like for me, when I write WZ, it's not like a gang thing. It's like a story. Where it's the, obviously the book, and it? it's like because people said to me other graffiti guys, "Oh, why don't you start WZ?" It's like, nah, it's not really that, mate. It was like we were a graffiti crew, but then we basically turned into a street gang. But yeah, WZ just this dis just disappeared, man. Everyone moves on with their lives. With all the knife crime that's going on in London now, is it like drug gangs that are dominating now? I don't know. It's, a, it's just a weird world. I think like back in WZ days, there wasn't. There was a few of us that were stabbing, and it was to create fear. Well, in my mind, it was to create fear. Like, don't go in the sevens. You stab someone, he'll stab you. Um, now it's like it doesn't matter like that to me years to build up a reputation i was a street kid from 10 years old like now it's just like normal kids that it's fear isn't it it's like it's, it's pumped so much in the media and everything it's like drill music everything it's just fear 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 so a kid's gonna be just like i was scared you carry a knife the more fear that's out there the more stabbings more kids are carrying knives and then you're just going to attract it you're going to walk around that corner walk around that corner and it just happens it's two young boys losing their life because they're not really real the majority of them are not really hardened murderers they're like one time oh, shank this kid shank that kid one kid's dead the other one's doing life so it's, um i think fear creates it what advice would you give to kids watching this who are carrying knives? It's so difficult because people always ask me this and they want me to come up with a with an answer, but I wouldn't have listened to anybody. Do you know what I mean? Um, so say you were asked like do a school talk on knife yeah, crime. Yeah. What would you tell those kids? I would tell them kids that to like basically look at my story. I've come from the dark side, basically wrote a book got it published it's being studied in universities in criminology and sociology i had no skills at school but i managed to do that and then i always saw kids rapping they want to rap and then i saw my friends rapping and i looked on and i just thought you guys are writing like lyrics you you can't write a book like i didn't want to be the same so basically to not follow the crowd it's very difficult when it's just pumped in your face as a kid. You're following music that glamorizes that lifestyle, bling lifestyle. It's, it's, it's difficult, but to try and break away from it. But I don't think, say you're a kid in trouble or in a gang, you're not usually coming from a home that's got money. Um, but unless your parents have got money or got some good connections to get you the hell out of that borough, how are you meant to leave that gang and you still got to walk through that bar and go to school? You're going to just become a victim. So that's what, yeah, unless unless you've got the funds, your family got the funds to really get you out of there, it's, it's like a trap. That's so if trap. kids in London watching this want you to speak at their school, would you be willing to do that and how would they contact you? Um, contact me through my website. I'll put that website yeah. in the description box below this video. Yeah. Yes, contact me through my website. Um, yeah, I'm well happy to. She's so, so willing to do, to do that. Yeah, yeah. Is there a certain part of London that you you yeah, located South, in? South London. Could, South London. South would be best London. For you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You said you're writing a second book. Yeah, I've, I I wrote a second book. It's with my publisher at the moment. Um, it's called the rough title is called um, a silent scream. Silent scream is like I'm screaming inside. I'm absolutely nuts, but no one around the outside seeing what's going on. So the Lost Boys ends in prison. I've just been sentenced that four and a half years. I'm with that killer, Richard Markham, um, and then it just ends. The following book is I get shipped to Wood Hill, all them crazy prison stories, the mental breakdown, and basically how difficult it is for a prisoner or someone with mental health issues to come out and basically fit back into society. So it, 
the, the purpose is that is to basically highlight mental health and prison prison release so that's with the publisher at the moment and should be being published hopefully by the end of the year so if you want gritty stories well told um kindle like i said i've got it on my kindle available worldwide the links are in the description box below this video if you want to get his book and are there any other ways people can support you out there have you got anything you'd like to say um yeah if you want to buy just if you want to buy the lost boys um you can buy it from amazon um ebay my publisher waterside press um or you can order it through wh smiths or waterstones and it's being studied in universities right now yes yeah, being studied in birmingham city university for the last couple of years 500 first year criminology students for the last couple of years this year should be studied again um and then they basically have to study my life and write a 2000 word essay on whether my behavior was due to nurture or nature and then i go up at the end of the year and i do a lecture with professor david wilson um and then it's just going into coventry uni criminology uh with dr tim turner that i think that's second year criminology students it's optional to be studied in aberdeen uni in sociology and it well i'm doing talks at the university of east london at the end of the year i've got loads of unis lined up now because i've got really good testimonials from professors and doctors and stuff it's i'm really pushing it in that direction love to get dr david wilson on the podcast i've watched a lot of his stuff on tv if he's out there watching any of these <laughs> yeah man you have been through so much so much stuff and you got a family yeah you got a book published you got yeah. a second book on the way yeah I, uh, also i sold the film option as well so it's being turned into a movie brilliant there's not been a british movie with graffiti in gangs in like they're the unique points of graffiti and then graffiti and satanism like it's never been done so yeah. like um i've got a good up-and-coming director good script writer and yes yeah, it's it's, it moves slow the film process but it's moving in the right direction man. That's a hell of a turnaround. Please let us know what you think about this podcast. Put your comments below. Put your likes down and subscribe. Yeah. Man, I just want to, you know, thank thanks, you for man. coming in. And just congratulations, yeah, yeah, thanks, man. Mate. Staying strong in your life Cheers, there, man. man. Brilliant. Thanks, yeah, mate. Well done.